If you would turn in your blue books to page number 37, or it's song number 37, a couple pages in, as the rest of us make our way in, we will glorify. We will glorify. We'll turn the time back to Rollin. Interesting, I got a <clears throat> I got a thing on my phone, it was a verse, and I thought I'd share it with you. But it's, it's the verse in 1 Corinthians. It says, so whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And I thought that was very fitting as we think about stewardship, as we think about money. What am I doing with what God has given me? Do everything you do to the glory of God. God cares. He really does care about our finances. Um, I think some people get the idea that he placed me here, and he does want me to glorify him with my life. But you know what? What I do with my money is my issue. No, God cares. God really does care. <clears throat> okay, we'd like to move into the, this next step here, um, thinking, about, um, thinking about budgets. And this session gets a little more intense, should I say. So... Um, Hopefully you can follow along and I can make it clear to you and that you can leave from here knowing a little bit more and hopefully not being more confused. So, um, And it's like I, I've said in the past, each family is unique and, and what works for one family is not going to work for another family. What worked for one individual is not going to work for another the other individual. So, you know, we all have to kind of work through that. So as we think about this next step on page 29 there, um, record all income, expenses, and giving, and savings. And this is where we get into the actual uh, track or project as we think about projected budgets. Um, Identify what is coming in and from where, what is going out to where, and then keeping a running balance in each category. Some, some things that we'll be talking about here is, number one, allocation. And we, you know, we, we talked a little bit about that in the last session where you were recording 
in the bottom in them categories, you were totaling up the different categories. Um, in other words, and, and you think about allocation, you know, you're, you're taking a percentage of your income and you are allocating it to each category. To allocate income, multiply by the category percentage. At income, subtract expenses to keep an up-to-date balance. Identify large upcoming expenses and build up the balance. Um, and so as we think about that, as we think about doing a budget, one of the first things I'd like to talk about here, uh, just, and if you go to page 31, there again on page 30 you have an Amos and Mandy story. Um, and I'll let you, I'm not going to read into that there. Um, just the picture there kind of gives me an idea of what he was talking about. We talked a little bit about last night about buying a Coke and a Snickers, you know, three times a week and how that adds up. And I think that was kind of their little issue they were having there, spending money on things that he probably could have done without. But we'll, um, that is something, like I said, that can wreak havoc on a budget too if you start looking at some of them things. But thinking about the envelope system there on page 31, how many of you have used the actual budget or the, the envelope system? Okay, so we have a few that, that are familiar with that. And you know, there's, there's a lot of questions about the envelope system. Um, but just basically right there you have it. Cash your paycheck. Divide the cash into each envelope by percentage. Spend cash by category. Balance for each category is amount of cash in the envelope. No cash means no spending. And so as you think about that, I mean, just a real, in a nutshell, you know, if you have, whether you have an envelope or whether, you, I've heard some guys use bank bags for each category and write, write it on there. Maybe, and then maybe keep a piece of paper or a note card in that in that bank bag showing your balance, what you're using, and then, you, you know, you keep a running balance for each envelope um, as the category. But there, you know, as you think about that, that envelope system, it's a, it's a great thing. The only, the only downside is if you're cashing a check and you're keeping a month's supply of income in bank bags, that can, I don't know, if that can be a, it could be a dangerous situation or, you know, so th there's some things you need to reckon with when it comes to an envelope system, you know, and, and so it's, it's probably far easier to keep it on paper, but the envelope system kind of helps you understand maybe the budgeting. Better. Um, but, you know, as you think about an envelope, as you think about putting money in there for, say, household and food, you know that when you, your wife goes to that, that envelope to, to take money out to go buy groceries and, you know, you get halfway through the month and you realize that the cash is gone. There is no money, more money for groceries. So what are we going to do now? Well, you've got to make, you've got to make two, one of two decisions. Either you're going to eat beans and bread the rest of the month or you're going to go to another envelope and pull that money out and show it on the card that you subtracted money out of there and you're going to transfer it into the food and household so you have money to go buy groceries. Um, and so therefore, thinking of an empty envelope, no cash means no spending. Uh, and that's the same way that we can, we can apply that to our regular, as we think about keeping it on paper, keeping track of our different categories. Um, but that, like I said, some, for some people, that is what it takes, being able to visually see something. You know, just seeing it on paper is one thing, but being able to go to the envelope, open it up, whoa, no cash. I can't spend in that category this month, or I've got to transfer it or do something different. We have some, I didn't bring one up here, but we do have some, I think we do. We might be out of them. Do we have any more cash envelope systems back there? It's just a small ring binder with some envelopes on it. Uh, it's kind of hard to put a lot of cash in that, but I, I would recommend it, even teaching, using it to teach your children. I mean, I think that's a great, a great thing for your children to try to kind of get them, them and teenagers, kind of get them, 
into the budgeting thing. It just helps them visualize, you know, what is going on with your money, you know, whether it's just a small amount. Um, so, yeah, that's just, that's one thing. But, yeah, I was, I was talking to a guy the other night. He was saying about a fellow that uses the bank bags. And I forget how it was. He said he, he was with them, and they got somewhere, and he reached under his seat and pulled out his bank bag. So, you know, I mean, hey, if that works for him, that's great. But like I said, it's, it, it comes down to the thing, because the question was asked, was well, that safe, or do we have to worry about electronic fraud? You know, there's a lot of that going on. So probably both ways, you're probably going to, you could run into an issue either way. But um, I don't know. Mattress and a box spring, you can get a lot of money bank bags between them, right? So uh, I guess that's up to you how you want to deal with that. <clears throat> okay, this here is this is a ledger, and if you go to page uh, page thirty two, you're gonna see you're gonna you're gonna see the ledger there. Um, and and I'd like to first of all I'd like to describe this in just a little bit of a try to make this as simple as we can. I look at a budget. It's kind of like a glorified checkbook. I mean, as far as the way we keep keep track of stuff here, and so if you if you think about if you think about your checkbook, and you know you know on the left hand side of your checkbook usually you have you have your dates. You're writing things in here, um, and then you usually you're having you usually put in there. Well, of course, in a checkbook, of course you're going to have your check number, and then you'll have a description of what that check was for. And so as you think, think a little bit about a checkbook when you think of doing a budget in a category form like this, the only difference, excuse me, the difference is you are, you're writing your description here. And for instance, you have a paycheck. In other words, you think about in your checkbook, you write deposit. And what you do, you, you record that deposit over, you know, in the column. Well, here, instead of what they're doing here, they're taking, okay, so here you deposited 1000 bucks. So now think about the budget categories. And you think about, okay, the checkbook stops right here, the way a normal checkbook would be. But in a budget, okay, so we've got all these different categories. So ahead of time, you know, you've, you've predetermined what is going to go into each category. So you've got your categories up top here, and this is just the... I don't know if this one, yeah, it's not showing the whole page. But the idea here is, so you take 11% out, and you're going to take 11% of that 1,000, and you're just going to do that all the way across the board here. And you're going to put your different categories, you know, whatever the percentage was, you're going to put that into the, you know, you're going to take that out of the paycheck. And then down below here, it shows your, you know, what the running balance, what the running balance would be. Of course, that's our first things so you know it's just showing the actual what the actual percentage was okay then on january the second martha hope there's no marthas here i'm not talking about you if it is she went and bought groceries she spent eighty dollars and so what did she do she went over here to the budget category for food and household and there was a hundred hundred dollars in there so she took out eighty bucks she spent eighty dollars and that left her with a balance of $20 in that category. So what she did over here, so here again, we're kind of in our checkbook. 1000 bucks. she subtracted $80. So now her checkbook total, in other words, see this here, 100%. This is showing what total was in our, in our budget, um, yeah, our budget total. So now she's down to $920. The next day... Amos had been at work, and he shot a nail through his shoe, missed his foot, thankfully, messed his shoes up, so he went and bought a new pair of boots. He must have went to the second-hand store because he didn't get new ones. <laughs> but anyway, so he bought a pair of boots for 20 bucks. Um, so anyways, he took that. Yeah, it's not showing on here, but it's over. It, anyways, it's over here somewhere. <laughs> But he, anyway, so he took twenty dollars out of out of clothing, and so that dropped it down. That dropped his total of his checkbook down to nine hundred dollars. 
uh, let me see here. Actually, if you look, um, yeah, I'm sorry. If you look on page 33, see clothing? See, it says minus 20 bucks. There was $40 in, in the clothing. So he bought a pair of shoes. He took $20 out of that. So now, now his clothing budget is down to $20. And his running total for his checkbook, he is down to $900. Well, guess what? He was on the way home after buying his shoes, and Martha or Mandy says, uh, Andy, we have company coming tonight. I was not expecting them. I don't have anything in the fridge to feed them. Why don't you stop by the grocery store and buy some stuff? So Andy, he, or Amos, goes by the store, and he ends up walking out with $90 worth of food. I don't know if he bought some steaks and who knows what all, but... Anyway, so he came home with groceries. Well, what did that do to the, to the food budget? That thing was suffering pretty bad already, already, right? Well, guess what? $90. What happened? All of a sudden, he's $70 in the hole. And, you know, so what are we going to do about that? Are we going to eat beans and bread the rest of the month? That's, that's, that's 23 more days of beans and bread. We're not going to be eating much more. Well, what they did, and this is where we talk about being flexible and, and adjusting. So look at the, he, on the 7th, and I don't know why they waited four days to decide to do this, but they transferred $70. They went in their savings, which had 190 bucks. They took $70 out. And they put it over into their food. Well, now they're back to zero. So they're still eating bed, beans and bread, right? So anyways, and then savings, of course, taking $70, it drops that to 120 bucks. Well, thankfully, on the 9th, he got a paycheck. And so he took that paycheck, and they just divided that. If you look in your book, you can see how they divided that out all the way across the column there. Um, on one nine, in the white there, he, they added all that back in. And then in the shaded area right below it, is where they, they went ahead and redone their balances for each category. In other words, there again, on this, on this left-hand side, we're kind of like our checkbook. There was a thousand bucks in there. They weren't broke. Some of their categories were suffering. But he'd added a thousand bucks. There was $810 in there. And so now they're up to $1,810 in their checkbook. And then adding to all their categories. So their categories are starting to look pretty good again. You know, they're kind of coming up a little bit. Well, guess what? Then he realized his rent was due. So, you know what? Well, we got $500 rent. So over here, category of housing, they had $620 in there. And he took 500, wrote a $500 check. Now he's down to $120. And, of course, the balance in the checkbook is down to $1,310. And so you can see, you can kind of see how that all works there. You know, the way they, you have your checkbook. But you have your categories across, across the columns there. And of course, you get to the bottom, and notice you have alms fund. Uh, there was $220 in there. They wrote a check to alms fund. Now it's 20 And of course, now you're down to the end of the page. And so you go ahead and you, know, you just transfer all them things into that blue, into the blue column. And just kind of just kind of revi re revision a little bit, go over this. Uh, your budget category up at the top there, your budget category percentage uh, from your budget, and then just showing your balance carryover, uh, and that's where that carryover actually would be like when we get to the bottom here, when you go to the next page, and, and in, in that ring binder, that is where when you flip the page, you're, you filled one whole page up, you flip the page, you would be carrying it over into that top where it says carryover. You would just be carrying this ending balance to that next page in the carryover, and you didn't, then you continue down through that, that page. Um, kind of what I talked about, he's allocating his paychecks down through there. Um, and then also the current balance he is keeping there in, in that row there. Which is kind of what we talked about, where they took the 20 bucks out of groceries, updated both balances, um, 
There again, subtract the expenses. Notice, you know, we had the minus 70. And then negative balances are not allowed. And then you just have to ask the question, where is that money going to come from? Well, they had to do a transfer, subtracted it, and added it to the income and food and house, updated the, the balances. Uh, there again, paycheck allocation all across the, across the page there. Updated the balances. Uh, and then, like I said, the ending balance there. <clears throat> And then after verifying balances, transfer them to the next page. And so in other words, one way to check yourself on this, if your balance coming down this way is $1,090, if your figures are right across the bottom of the page there on page 32 and 33, them balances, if you add all them, all them different categories, what is left over, in them categories, if you add all them up across them two pages, they should equal 1,090 also. So you're kind of, it's kind of like double checking yourself there. And if there's an issue, if it don't quite work, something don't match, well, you, there's a mistake. You need to go find it. Um, or you can just keep going on, right? And then have issues later on. Yeah, I would double check it. <clears throat> this here is just showing, this is showing page uh, 34, 34 and 35, kind of in a smaller, just kind of the whole thing on one page. But just giving, there again, you can just kind of see the whole thing. Uh, but notice one thing I want to point out um, on, page, on page 34 there. Look down through there. Go down to... Uh, Go down to January the 15th. And what I want to point out, we talked about reoccurring costs. We talked about reoccurring costs and how they will get you if you're not careful. Notice what happened. 15, 16, 17, 18th, and 19th. He was stopping by Casey's every day. This must have been a number of years ago because he was only paying three bucks. So <laughs> things have changed a little bit. But the idea is, notice how them things can add up. And notice if you go over to, uh, where do you take them out of? Food and household. Look what it, 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 wreck, it, them, them little things, them little expenses can wreck a budget real quick. You know, and if Mandy's looking at that, she's probably wondering, why in the world? Why didn't you just tell me to put an extra granola ball in or something, you know, or anyways. But so them are, them are just some things to keep, to, to think about. Uh, they can, them reoccurring costs that you think are just very minimal, they can get you real quick. And that's why, you know, Amos was talking about, you know, if nothing else, just keep a track, keep track of your expenses in a month or, or three months of time and, and see some of them little incidental costs we think that we're spending, you know, oh, what's this? You know, that wasn't much. And then you realize you did it 20 times during them three months and think of and look at what the actual total was. Some key points to remember about the budget ledger. It only works if it is kept consistently and completely. It allows a faithful steward to account for his use of resources. And I mentioned this already, but the high cost of small repeated expenses and then also the idea of transfers to savings accounts. I forgot to mention that one there on page uh, 34 and 36. Uh, notice where they, they borrowed from one category and put it in the other. And someone asked me the question during the break. They were saying, you know, when, what do you do with the money that you are saving for taxes? What should you do with that? Should you just leave it in that category? I, I, and I suggested, and it may vary from person to person, but... I would recommend having a savings account that you're dumping these, these extra, these, when these funds are building up, dump them in a savings account. Something that you know, and then let me add to that, dump them in a savings account and then keep, keep a running balance of your savings account and show what money is in there and what that money is for. Say, in other words, if you're saving up for property tax and you're putting in your savings, Keep a category in your savings, a subcategory, that says 
2023 property tax, $500, and every time you add to it, add to that balance and, and write it down. Don't just think about it. Think, don't just think, I'm going to remember that, because if you're old like me, you're going to forget. I got a good memory, it's just very short. But the idea is you kind of keep a running balance in your savings of them, of them uh, balances from other categories that you're saving that you know are coming, them expected expenses. And I think that will help you know what's going on. Write it down. Keep a, keep a running balance of them. <clears throat> okay, go to page, um, let's see here, 40 and 41. And what I'm going to do, if you just want to take a little bit of time and just go down through the, in the shaded spots, I'm going to give you just a little bit of time to do this. Go ahead and allocate, or just write the figures in there, and kind of, kind of, and like I said, the the cheater page, you know, is is uh, back there. Um, yeah, back there on page 32. But just kind of work down through that once. I'll I'll give you just a little bit of time to do that. And if you have any questions, raise your hand, and I'll I'll come come at, try to answer it for you. <clears throat> But all you're doing is you're just using the figures they were using and you're just writing them down. In the red there it shows uh, groceries, $80. So you put $80, subtract it from $1,000. Uh, but you just work some of them out once. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions referring to this page actually? Or do you not quite understand what needs to be done there? Just, just notice. And it's not, it's not oriented on number on seven, in read seven. When you transfer, you don't, you don't subtract that from your balance in that total column. Just reallocate Right, yeah. Yep. And like I said, the way to check yourself then at the bottom, you know, if you add them figures all the way across the bottom and add your numbers on the left hand side, them things should equal a thousand ninety. You know, that's that's one way you can check that as you think about as you think about budgeting. Anybody else have something that you're confused about? And if you have questions, you know, referring to this budget, you know, after the, feel free to come to me afterwards and I can try to explain it more in detail if you don't quite understand. Um, <clears throat> Okay, someone else kind of asked that same question earlier, maybe in reference to another category. But I, I guess my thing is, you know, if you get to the end of the month and, and you're just, or end of three months, and you're just constantly running short, I think, I think you know, you need to, yeah, that's where you need to just start adjusting some things and realizing that, you know, hey, this ain't working. Let's, let's adjust it and try. It's, it's kind of like we've said before, you know, a budget is not, something that is permanent. It's something that needs to be flexible. It's something that we need to adjust to. It's, it's fluid. You know, it's kind of like a river flowing through a river bank. You know, there's times where that bank's probably going to change at times, you know, as far as where it's at. It's, it's the same way with the budget. We're going to have to adjust them according to the number of children we have, you know, in just different circumstances. Yeah. Okay, let's move on here. Um, how does current income compare with current outgo? And we talked, 
had this a little earlier. Another thing to think about, uh, create a practical record keeping system. As you think about keeping track of your stuff, put all receipts and paycheck stubs in a specific container or file. Sit down periodically and enter the income and expenses. And you know that, and that's the thing, as you think about a budget, remember I said it takes discipline and it takes consistency. And, and it's good if you can do it, whether it's the last of the month, you know, for that previous month, or, you know, but try to have, you know, you think about if you have an AC at home and you have a filter you need to change. You know, it's good to have a systematic way of changing that. And you, you know the every, every month on the 10th or every second, whatever, you know, it, you, you kind of have something in place that you just, it's just automatic. And that's what it's going to take on a budget to be consistent. So at the end of the month, do a budget checkup with your spouse, budget date. Someone asked about that. I said, take her out for coffee once a month. That's, that's the least you can do. And go sit down and talk about it, uh, go over it. Transfer funds to savings accounts on a regular monthly basis. We talked about that. Um, so yeah, as you think about being diligent to know the state of your flocks and look well to your herds. You know, God blesses us. How well do I know what he has given me and what am I doing with that? And, and think of di being diligent. You're being careful. You're being faithful to what God has given you. The steward is careful and faithful in caring for God's resources that been, have been given into his hand. Um, and, I, and I like to think of this as, this is the idea of not only preserving what God has given us, but what am I doing to even improve on what he has given me? Sometimes we like to just do the bare minimum. But let's think about what can I not only do to preserve it, but what can I do to enhance it that much more? What God has given me to, or entrusted to me. That's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Come after, afterwards, come to me if you have any questions. I want to thank you for your hospitality, and Lord bless y'all as you serve him here. For those of you who weren't here last night, if you're interested in our magazine newsletter, Stewardship Connections, comes out four times a year. It's free. There's no cost. There's a sign-up sheet in the back or on the table. Just sign your name and address there, and you'll be on our mailing list and get it in the coming months. Nothing said about uh, debit cards. Debit cards are a valuable thing, better than credit cards, especially for young families starting out. I would recommend using a debit card rather than a credit card. A few ideas here, at closing this thing out. Uh, this is a picture of kind of a typical American male in his lifetime, his earning and expenses. Start out about age 10 there. The, uh, the top line is your income, the bottom line is the expenses, and that dark blue area is what we call disposable income or discretionary income. It's money that's left over that you can do with what you want. Roland said there's three things we can do with our money. What are they? Save it. What else? Give it or spend it. Yeah. So at age 10, you're uh, mowing yard for the neighbor, get some uh, cash for that, living at home, no expenses, it's all money in hand. About age 17 and 18, you get a full-time job and your income goes up and still living at home. There's, again, that, that blue area gets pretty wide there, unless, of course, dad is keeping the money at that point, which is probably a good idea, at least the bulk of it, or at least some of it because there's a lot of money wasted in those early years. There's a lot of shiny objects out there for young people, especially young fellows. You know, the hunting trips, the bows, all the, the sporting stuff. A lot of money can be spent and wasted in those early years if it's available. But then come about 21, 22, you think about getting married and then uh, you want to buy a house and you go to AF for a loan. And the first question is, we ask is, do you have any money to put down? Well, we've spent pretty lavishly there in our youth and uh, don't have, really have any money to put down. No, I don't have money to put down, but I can borrow it from dad. 
The question is not, can you get it? The question is, do you have it? How much money do you have available to put on a house? And if the answer is, why well, I don't have any, but I'm going to be changing my spending habits from now on since I'm married. Uh, no, sorry, you will not get a loan from AF, or probably not from a bank either. We may allow you to, <clears throat> to borrow 10% of it, but, uh, and then we'll ask for a cosigner. But if I see an application coming in, a young fellow, 23, 24, wants to buy a $200,000 house, and he's managed to save $40,000 for the down payment, I'm impressed because I don't see that very often. He will almost certainly get a loan. So young fellows, that early stage in life of the giving, saving, and spending, what should perhaps be the focus at that stage in life? Saving, saving. yeah. Well, of course, then you get married, <clears throat> your uh, wages go up, but your expenses go up, the children come along, and in those you know, 30 to 50 range there, raising a family, paying the mortgage, that discretionary, the money left over gets a little thin. But come about 55 and 60, the children are gone, the mortgage is paid, and you're still drawing maybe at your peak of your earning power at that point, that blue area gets a little fatter again. In fact, it gets pretty fat. At that stage, maybe you should start thinking about focusing on what? Giving. giving. At that point, we could up our giving, yes. So that's just, uh, and one of the things that happens in the older age there is that we have this extra money now, and so we can spend it on ourselves because on stuff that I've always wanted but didn't, couldn't afford it, but now I can afford it, and so I'm going to go ahead and you know, do that extra stuff that I always wanted to do. Be a little careful there. You're setting an example for the younger people coming after you. Self-employed people, this includes subcontractors, farmers. How do you handle your finances? Well, one thing you sh definitely should have is two checking accounts, one for a personal account, one for the business account. Pay yourself out of the business every month to your personal account. When I was farming, I had a, we had a personal account my wife took care of. I had a farm account. I took care of that. And every month, we would transfer X number of dollars to the personal account. And Sarah took care of that. This actually helps you identify how much your business is actually making. You're not, your business is not making a profit until you have paid your taxes, taken out depreciation, paid all your employees, paid yourself. At that point then, what's left is profit. What you're paying yourself is not profit, that is a business expense. It's like you've got to treat it like you're paying anyone else. You pay yourself. And it's only after you've paid yourself that you're showing a profit. For those with variable income, uh, produce growers, uh, others who have times of high income and then low income, how do you handle that? Well, we suggest making a kind of a comfortable budget. How much does it actually take to live? Come up with those numbers. And then all your income, whether it's from the produce or the chickens or whatever, to put that into a separate account. Just let that there. But every month, draw out the same amount throughout the year. This income is going to be going up and down all the time here. Keep it to steady on, the, on your personal level. Every month you transfer three, dollars $4,000, whatever it takes to live. Keep this steady and take it out of this account over here. A monthly transfer from saving to checking to cover the family budget. Deposit all the income into a savings and make that monthly transfer. Some of these benchmarks were mentioned already. Housing shouldn't be more than 33% of your income. Do you know what percentage of income you're paying on housing? This includes not just the mortgage, but the mortgage, the taxes, insurance, and even the maintenance. If you're making 4000 a month, your housing cost should not be more than 1200 a month, and that's on the high side. I'm, I'd much rather see it down in the 20, 25% range. You must have 20% down when you're buying a property or equity accordingly. 
and a maximum debt of to income of four to one. If you're making $50,000, we don't want to see you have more than $200,000 in debt. So one app come in one time when a guy was showing $30,000 of income, he wanted to buy a $300,000 farm. It wasn't going to work. We told him he simply doesn't have enough income for that kind of, of uh, debt. That would have been a 10 to 1 ratio. Maximum of 4 to 1. <clears throat> Signs of trouble? If all you have to take to your account at the end of the year is a box full of receipts, you're not doing a very good job. At the very least, if you don't want to do a planning budget, if that looks like too much work for you, at least keep a tracking budget. Keep track of your income and expenses month to month. If all you do, all the records you have is your ATM or uh, checkbook balance, if that's what you're using to tell where you're at, you're not doing a good job, you probably will have trouble sometime. That is poor record keeping. A budget is a long-range plan. It sets current limits. Again, you, de you decide how much you want to spend on groceries and all the others, and then stick with that as much as you can, but recognize that they are up and down cycles. And again, reconcile your bank account every month. That is a must. If she likes to do it better, let her do it. If you like to do it better, you do it. But make sure it gets done. So if you're in the hole, Want to get out? What are you going to do? Well, first of all, why are you in the hole? And again, housing is one of those big things. We like to have a nice house for our own comfort, because our peers have it, because it makes it look good. But if you're too high, you're going to end up in the hole and cause a lot of undue stress. Consumer debt, if you can't control your spending, if you're eating out all the time, going on trips all the time, and you can't afford it, you're going to end up in trouble. Every once in a while, it's a matter of low income, but most times it's a matter of too many expenses. And so, you know, sometimes there's lack of work or an injury, and dad is out of work, that can happen, but uh, most times it's overspending. So when you're in the hole, who's best to help you out of the hole? Somebody's in the hole with you? Yeah, you can cry on each other's shoulders, it makes you feel good, but you better have someone up above to pull you out of the hole. And that's where your deacon, your trusted friend, an advisor, someone can help you out of the hole, not someone who's in it with you. So, form habits. That's one of the things we'd like to emphasize here in conclusion, especially starting young. Form good financial habits. Know what your, your income is. Know what you're spending it for. Make good habits. Know where it's coming from or where it's going. Make a budget. Understand what a budget can help you to accomplish. Do what you know and understand. Knowing doesn't automatically trans translate into doing. If you don't do what you know, your knowledge is useless. Take it from your head to your hands to your life. Make it practical. A budget can help you decide on limits with your head that you will abide with with your hands. A budget identifies what you can expect and have reasonable expectations. Roland mentioned that quite often. Make it reasonable. Make it work. So, our goal is to be faithful servants. The test of, of our faithfulness to God is how we handle money. If we're not faithful with the material things, how can God expect us to be faithful with the true riches? So we work, <clears throat> God provides, we give, we save, we spend, and we find contentment and joy in life in using those resources that God has given to us. So thank you for coming. Leave your calculators and pens at your seat there. We'll collect them. And uh, I will turn it over to the moderator for closing. Are there any questions that someone would like to raise? 
we're up against our time here, and we're glad to take any questions if someone has something. But uh, probably better to wait till afterward, and we'll be glad to entertain questions on a one-to-one -one level. We don't want to hold you unduly. Thank you, Amos and Rollin. I think I can say truly thank you on behalf of everyone here. I know I've enjoyed it, and uh, as I've learned and listened to what they presented, they've done their part, and it's only going to do me as much good as what I apply, as what you apply from here. So... It's up to us to take it from there. So thank you very much for your time, for your resources in coming and uh, in doing that. In closing, uh, a couple of announcements. Um, there is flash drives available if you would like to have a recording of the sessions. Um, there's a sign up for sheet for that um, it's going to be underneath the bulletin board that is located just before you come up the steps into the auditorium on the east side there um, if you can sign your name there if you would like as soon as you can after the service so that way we can get that taken care of um, they're doing those at I think five dollars a piece to cover the cost for getting that done and getting those purchased um, it is also both yesterday and today is on the YouTube live stream as well um, if you want to go back and re watch listen to portions of it or all of it um, if you look up Sunnyside Mennonite Kelowna you can find that on there um, as far as in leaving if you would not mind um, checking around you, picking up whatever cups, trash, etc., that there is, and leaving that in the trash cans in the back as you exit. That would be appreciated. Um, and then I've been asked to make an announcement that um, most of you would know the store in town, the best of Iowa, is a bakery here. A couple of the ladies from church work there, and they were going to have a celebration thing today and because of the storm doing some damage to their personal property they've postponed their celebration thing but they had made a lot of bread in preparation for that and that is going to get put on a table in the back they would like that to be taken and if you feel led you may leave a donation for that um, i think they're going to put a container on the table there. So, um, Elwin, am I missing anything? I think that's everything. Why don't we stand for a closing prayer? <clears throat> thank you, Father God, for this weekend. We thank you for godly insight into our finances and how we can budget, how we can honor you with how we handle our finances. We ask that you would Go with Amos and Rollin from here as they travel home. Yet today, I believe, you would watch over them and keep them safe. Pray that you would bless them in the work that they do and the time that they've spent preparing and presenting. Guide each one of us as we go from here, as we take to heart what we've learned to honor you most of all. Pray this in your name. Amen. And you're dismissed.